It's beautiful, isn't it? Big brown trout in crystal clear water, rising to your dry fly. It's what we dream of. It's what anglers travel from all around the world to New Zealand for. But it's not natural. Brown trout aren't native to New Zealand. That fish was never meant to be here. It was never meant to rise to your fly. However, brown trout are here, and the story of how they came to be in our waters is a truly fascinating one. My name is Jack Koch. I'm a fly fisherman and a historian from Christchurch, New Zealand. When I first started fishing, I didn't really give much thought to how or why brown trout had come to be here in New Zealand. I knew that the rivers and lakes had always been here, but that the trout hadn't. I decided to take a closer look. Through archival research and sifting through old newspapers, I discovered that if not for the efforts of early acclimatizers, this incredible fishery that we have in New Zealand simply may not have existed at all. I first came to fly fishing with my dad. We picked it up at the same time, really just for an activity to do together. Increasingly, it's become a really huge part of my life. Now, I know a lot of people say that, but I think in this instance it's true. My choice of universities, Canterbury and the South Island, was so heavily influenced by the adventures Dad and I had had road tripping and fishing through the South Island. And it was the thought of not being able to get into the hills, not being able to chase those big brown trout, that ultimately meant when I finished my degree, I wasn't ready to jump into an office. So I decided to pursue my love of history further, and I found ways to incorporate fly fishing into that. First through my honours research on the introduction of brown trout to Canterbury, and then through my PhD on the introduction of brown trout to New Zealand. And it's been an incredible journey. What I've discovered through my research has simply blown me away. The efforts that were gone through to bring brown trout to New Zealand, and the impacts they've had on this country, are just staggering. I'm not sure exactly what it is about brown trout, but right from the start, they've always had just a little bit more draw for me than any other species. It's as if they're that very little bit more aware. They're just 10% harder to catch. And that's everything in the end. Knowing that you're really seeking the ultimate challenge that New Zealand fly fishing has, that, that to me is, is fantastic. And as I've caught more fish and I've become more accustomed to it, I realise it's really not the fish I seek. It's experience. And I've always said that trout fishing is a, a conduit to that experience. It's the places, the people, being out there with nothing but a pack and a tent and a sleeping mat and simply being. I love the whole experience that comes along with fishing and I just enjoy being out in the hills, being away from everything else and, and simply reconnecting, really. New Zealand was first discovered by the Māori almost a millennia ago. European discovery didn't occur until 1642, when the Dutch explorer Abel Tasman first sighted New Zealand. And it wasn't until 1769, when James Cook first landed in New Zealand. Early European colonisation was primarily very isolated, small whaling stations, very small groups of individuals, rather than an organised settlement. That sort of organised settlement didn't occur until after the Treaty of Waitangi, when Christchurch, Dunedin and Wellington were all founded. The settlers were primarily English and Scottish, with a few Irish and a few other nationalities as well. Then subsequently, the gold rush that struck New Zealand brought a huge variety of settlers in. These migrants often sought to recreate the opportunities they had back home, and even to expand upon them. Many were driven away from the United Kingdom because of the lack of opportunities they had. These settlers travelling to New Zealand perceived the rivers of New Zealand as barren, there were no fish they could relate to, none like their European fish. And so they sought to rectify it. These settlers sought to improve New Zealand's rivers by placing trout and salmon in them. But not only that, they actually thought they had a right to rectify it, and I think that's the really important part. Settlers at the time really couldn't fathom the implications of their actions. The reality is that the introduction of trout and this recreation of home was part of a much wider movement to establish British culture in New Zealand. I mean, this can be seen through architecture, through religion, through the food. There's a much bigger movement of recreating home here than just the fish. It was simply the desire to improve the land and to recreate home that led them to introduce these species. In my research, reading article after article, there was one name that kept popping up 
Andrew Mitchell Johnson. Johnson became a bit of an enigma for me. I knew the role he'd played in the introduction of brown trout to New Zealand. I know he was the curator of the Canterbury Acclimatisation Society. I know that he was the first to attempt to bring brown trout to New Zealand. I've even held a letter he wrote in my hands. And yet, as far as I know, no photo of him exists. I have no idea what he looks like. Likely the reason that I'd never heard Johnson's name until I started this research was that as a result of a spat between himself and Samuel Charles Farr, who was the secretary of the Canterbury Acclimatisation Society, Johnson's role in the introduction of brown trout to New Zealand was highly diminished. To a certain extent, he was a victim of history. It turns out he had an enormous role. To the extent that the introduction can be attributed to just one man, it would be Andrew Johnson. Johnson arrived in New Zealand in 1864, almost immediately after the Canterbury Acclimatisation Society was founded. The 1860s saw a movement of acclimatisation societies spreading throughout the world, to the point that every major centre in New Zealand in the 1860s had an acclimatisation society. These societies sought to introduce beneficial species to foreign lands. Often they were only small societies, and yet the impact that they were able to have on our environment was immense. I bet early acclimatisers like Andrew Johnson never quite realised that out of their introductions of brown trout to New Zealand would boom this entire international industry. I mean, guys like Tony Entwistle have built their entire livelihood around New Zealand's brown trout. There is a, a mystery and a magic New Zealand site fishing. You know, you can go many places in the world and catch a large volume of trout just by fishing the water. You know, blind fishing as some people would call it. But there are very few places in the world that you can go to and stalk clear water, see an individual trout, and then pit yourself against that one, one quarry, one adversary. And that is a real appeal. Despite Johnson's diminished presence in the record, he was the first person to attempt to bring trout to New Zealand. Johnson's plan was an ambitious one. Effectively, he got an enormous tank lined with lead, put it on a ship, and put live fish in it, sealed the tank, and kind of hoped all would be well. And we've got to remember, we're talking about an oceanic voyage from the United Kingdom across two tropics all the way to New Zealand. And so it was possibly not unsurprising that when he landed in New Zealand, he discovered that, but for I think one or two goldfish, all of his animals were dead. <laughs> Johnson's attempt to introduce trout to New Zealand came in the wake of the news that in early 1864, trout had been successfully introduced to Tasmania. And this was huge news. It proved that it was possible and it electrified the public imagination. One of the hallmarks of brown trout in New Zealand is just how well adapted they are. And that almost can't be stressed enough. Beyond simply the distributions by people, brown trout are anadromous, which means they run to sea and they'll migrate themselves up other rivers. They are themselves colonists spreading throughout the country. The value of the New Zealand fishery is such that some scientists, like Rasmus Gabrielson from the Cawthorn Institute in Nelson, have devoted the majority of their working life to studying the resource. New Zealand rivers and ecosystems are a great place to study fisheries ecology. The, the clarity of the water and the wilderness resource available here makes New Zealand a natural laboratory to study these questions and to look at how fish populations should be managed. Brown trout are an extremely flexible and adaptable species and this was probably the single most important characteristic for allowing them to gain a solid foothold early on after introduction to New Zealand. The Tasmanian success proved the catalyst that the New Zealand societies needed to spark themselves into action. Fish ponds were built, facilities were prepared, all in anticipation of the arrival of trout. It wasn't until 1867, following a very successful breeding year, that the Tasmanians were able to supply trout over to New Zealand. They were in discussions with both the Canterbury and the Otago societies, and yet neither society were willing to quite take the plunge at this point. Upon news that Canterbury had declined the offer of over from Tasmania, Johnson came up with a proposal of his own. Rather than the Canterbury Society paying for the cost of the voyage, Johnson would foot the bill. He'd undertake that personal financial risk himself on the basis that the Canterbury Society pay him back one pound for every trout race to maturity. Johnson arrived in Hobart Town, Tasmania in September 1867 
And here he met with the Tasmanian Salmon Commissioners, effectively their version of the Acclimatisation Society. Together they collected the ova, and they packed the ova tightly into wooden boxes lined with wet moss. These boxes were then put into an ice compartment on the ship, and ready for the big journey back to New Zealand. Johnson's return from Tasmania was met by extremely rough weather. He stopped briefly in Dunedin to give one box of over to the Otago Acclimatisation Society before continuing on to Littleton, arriving on the 22nd of September. All newspapers carried news of his arrival, and a huge number of people turned out at the acclimatisation grounds to try and see these tiny little over. And yet, as the days went by, with no trout hatching and more and more over going off, Johnson came to the realisation that his whole effort may have been in vain. Finally, on the 10th of October, 1867, one lonely little ovum hatched into the very first live trout in New Zealand. In the following days, two more trout were discovered in the hatching boxes. Whilst three trout, or three pounds, doesn't exactly represent a huge economic return for Johnson, the sheer number of articles that I read announcing the arrival of trout in New Zealand is a testament to just how big of a deal this was. When I first started fishing, New Zealand was to a degree unknown, particularly the South Island. So it didn't have a reputation as such. Zane Gray had built the North Island, the rainbow trout, Tongariro thing, but the South Island was a little bit of a mystery. So the hard thing in the early days was getting anybody to take any notice of us. Visiting anglers were looking for brown trout fisheries around the world. And as I coined the phrase, we had at the time the best of wild brown trout. And so that's, uh, that was the mainstay. When they saw that first lone fish sitting there and they had to target it and they could no longer make the cast, the heart was going and all of a sudden the skills went out the door. And I think that's the challenge, you know. When you're confronted by one big fish, that is a different story to just throwing a beautiful cast at the water. And, uh, and I think that, that is the major appeal, that experience. Despite the immense excitement that New Zealand finally had trout, the reality is that to establish a breeding population from just three fish will be extremely difficult. And this feat was rendered utterly impossible when, to Johnson's dismay, Two of the three trout managed to wriggle through a grate and escape into the Avon. The following year, in 1868, the Canterbury, Otago, Nelson and Southland Acclimatisation Societies all received shipments of trout over from Tasmania, from which they were able to establish breeding populations. By 1870, a number of societies, most notably Canterbury and Otago, had successful breeding programs and they were able to furnish trout over throughout the country at a minimal cost. With each subsequent breeding season, the number of trout in New Zealand increased, as did the extent to which they were distributed throughout the country. By horse and cart, by rail, and in pails in the hands of enthusiasts, brown trout were spread throughout some of the most remote and rugged parts of New Zealand. Testament to this can be seen in the fact that those explorers cutting the now famous Milford Track carried with them a small tin of trout to distribute in rivers and streams they crossed along the way. I think one of the most interesting things about brown trout is just how varied the places they live are. I mean, from the sea to the headwaters of a river, every step along the way has a slightly different fishery. And that's brilliant as an angler because it gives us variety. And it doesn't hurt that some of the places they live are just painfully beautiful. The backcountry or wilderness fishing experience is really defined by having lots of peace and solitude and the ability to fish undisturbed. And this is a really precious, sensitive activity. As an angler, fishing for a large fish in gin clear waters is pretty much what everybody dreams of. You know, the ability to see how the fish reacts to that fly when you put it down on the water and, and, and to sort of instantly have feedback whether you did a good job or not. That, that's the stuff dreams are made of. You know, that's what we all want. For a number of years, while trout were established in New Zealand, fishing for them was actually prohibited under the Salmon and Trout Act of 1867. The first fishery in New Zealand was the Water of Leith, which was opened in 1874 by the Otago Acclimatisation Society. Anglers could pay one pound, and they'd get a fishing licence and the ability to fish for trout thousands of kilometres from their native range. As trout numbers increased and they became more spread throughout the country, different regions would open their fisheries, typically for a similar price. 
The acclimatisation societies, as they were in the 1860s, no longer exist today. In 1987, under the Conservation Act, they were all merged together as Fish and Game New Zealand, and Fish and Game has taken on many of the roles these acclimatisation societies once fulfilled. From managing the resource, enforcing the regulations, and mounting major environmental legal campaigns, Fish and Game is really the main voice for our fishery. Researching the story had taken me on an incredible journey. I felt like I'd been right there alongside Johnson. As I was hiking through the Southern Alps, I could imagine being one of those explorers, taking a pail of trout into some remote lake or into some beautiful river. It just got me thinking. These trout have been here so long. They've come to have such value. At what point do we simply accept them as part of our environment? Brown trout have come to thrive in our rivers and lakes, and yet they now face threats that may endanger their continued existence in New Zealand. New Zealand has an amazing fishery resource, but it is under pressure, and it's two different types of pressures. In the backcountry, the wilderness fishery resource that we're most famous for, it's definitely vulnerable to overuse. If you have too many people fishing a river, obviously the experience is going to be degraded. It's a real risk of loving the river to death. Anglers have a huge role to play in raising awareness for the values they want society to manage for when it comes to waterways and the fish populations that live within them and depend on the health of them. Like many other countries, New Zealand's been slow to wake up to the negative effects of land use intensification. And, and the recent awakening of the New Zealand public and the public outcry to do more to preserve the special character of our waterways is really a testament to how much value we all place on on rivers and their fish. When I first started guided fishing, it was dirt roads to the Marawea. But that was enough wilderness for most people. What we now take for granted, the great backcountry experience, was the cream on the cake. So um, the world has changed. You want to be proud of what you've done. We go fishing to catch fish. You can't make any apology for that at all. But the time has come to uh, to, to uh, show a little bit more responsibility. It never occurred to me until this year that 2017 is actually the 150 year anniversary of the first time trout were introduced to New Zealand. And New Zealand as a country isn't much older than that. Our founding document, the Treaty of Waitangi, was only signed in 1840. And so trout have been a part of New Zealand for the vast majority of its existence. And I think they've come to have a really significant part in our culture, in our sporting heritage. When we're out there fishing for brown trout, I think it's really important to remember how long these fish have been here and how much effort was gone through to bring them here. I think that, the fish itself, can be our tangible connection to the history. I've spent the last five years of my life so deeply involved in the story, researching it in the archives, pouring through newspapers, just throwing myself into the details of it. But I've also spent untold hours exploring the rivers, exploring the lakes, exploring the country. When I'm out in the river, it's just me and the fish. And all I can see in front of me is my dry fly riding down the current and that big brown coming up to eat it. Riding on freight train again, I'm hoping that my lesson will find me love. The wind brought up the clouds and shifted north, and stormy weather starts to turn. And I'm holding all my breath back, and I'm holding all my breath back for my deed. Inside out for you and I'll watch it burn up 
facets as you watch your lover's caskets being shot. I'm holding on to tame as you're stacking all these names in years to come. But I'm still trying hard. It's messing with my brethren and my love. I like to say that I can 